This is the second and last half of a COVID Legacy Pledge for Seniors. I'm Connie Barlow. Today's April 20th, 2020, and the first half I posted uh, April 17th. If you haven't already watched part one, the first part of this series, please go back and watch it now. That's the whole background, uh, the situation, the interpretation, and why I'm motivated to post here what I call a senior COVID legacy pledge. Here's the overview. A COVID legacy pledge, turning fear into calm and crisis into generosity by insisting on palliative care at home and or saying no to ICU medical interventions. In the first half of this uh, video series, What and Why a Legacy Pledge by Seniors, that was all the background. This one here is a sample COVID legacy pledge that is my own sample for anyone to use and obviously make their own. And then two things I'll just mention here that you can find on this webpage uh, is a long section, responses to this pledge and related news and obviously I keep updating that one, and resources on natural and timely death. And there you're gonna find a, a list, an annotated list of the various text, audio, and video documents and programs that I've presented to audiences in the past and also posted on YouTube, uh, where I have been concerned about how our culture is death phobic, unlike other cultures in the past why that's difficult and how we can come out of it. So I've also got that there in case you're curious as to why this situation that happens to be coronavirus 19 is inducing me to stand up and make a statement like this that is not popular. People prefer to keep this private and yet I think we need to be as seniors, just seniors, outspoken about um, our capacity our responsibility and our desire to have agency in this. This is not about our society sacrificing seniors. This is about seniors themselves one by one saying, this is how I want to act in this time of societal crisis. And I have an opportunity to make a gift that I can do joyfully. Now here, I'm going to be narrating pretty much straight through my sample pledge that I posted. This is personal to me. The preamble is my personal situation, my, especially my experience of my ancestors. I come from a lineage where timely and natural death is something that has been achieved, has been done honorably, and has not been viewed by anyone as a sacrifice. The second and third parts of this COVID legacy pledge are very brief. They're just to the point. The pledge itself, what I pledge to not want to have ventilation, advanced treatment. I do want comfort care, palliative care. I'd prefer not to go into a hospital, no 911. And then a plea. And the plea is an interpretation I'm asking family members or anyone else who may be concerned for my well-being, a plea for what, uh, how I hope they will take this, how it will be received, and then a very short blessing at the end. After this simple narration that I'm going to be doing with the words scrolling down here, uh, I'll be adding a few more segments here about my personal family history because I encourage everyone to do this. It's really important to uh, try to convey to the younger generations and our friends what our experience is and why it makes us inclined to want to make this kind of a pledge for ourselves. Secondarily, I think it may also be very, very helpful to have that kind of expansion as an appendix taken into the hospital for the medical staff, advanced directives, in, in case anyone ends up there and they prefer not to be there. It can be very useful for the medical staff to see that, hey, this person is real about this. If anyone extraneous in the family comes in and unfamiliar with this and protests against 
no advanced care. Well, here's a document that shows it. And more than that, I, my suspicion is that a lot of hospitals now are trying to guard against malpractice, seriously. And so if anyone in the family has any quibbles about not doing absolutely every diagnostic test and every hookup that's possible, then they're gonna do it. It's a lot cheaper to do that than face malpractice. So it has to be pretty watertight that this is really what the person wants and that there's documentation the hospital can have beyond the advanced directive for this particular situation that should any family member post some objection, they can bring this out. So they may feel freer to simply put the person over to palliative care if for some reason we end up in an emergency room. All right, that's too long an explanation. Right now, I'm going to start the actual reading, and then we'll see how much time I put in at the end with the little addendums of my own, simply as an example of how you might want to embellish your own understanding of your ancestry and what has been done for you by previous generations. Part one, preamble. I, Connie Barlow, Born 6 April 1952 of Frederick Charles Barlow and Helen Chesley Barlow at a hospital in Detroit, Michigan, have been graced with a life full of opportunities. I lived my childhood and adult working years in what I now see was a unique age of exuberance. Now that's one of the few terms that I've linked to in this document age of exuberance is a really important concept for me and I want my family to know about it. And that's the concept that in the brief time in which we've exploited the fossil fuels, making it more difficult, needing frac fracking in order to get more, recognizing that we can't keep taking carbon out of the ground and throwing it up into the atmosphere because what it's doing to climate, and all the other things that we're doing, uh, were handled during an age of exuberant when it was possible to do all this. And we had lost sight of traditional concerns for provisioning for future generations, that all of us come from lineages that certainly did that. We lost sight of that. I was in the boomer generation. We were the main beneficiaries. The generations to come are going to have to live with a lot more of the problems than we will. But I just wanted to say that's one of the few terms that's very important, and so I linked it. Continuing on, I lived my childhood and adult working years in what I now see was a unique age of exuberance for those of my heritage and nationality. Yes, some of my peers suffered polio in early childhood, I was four or five when I received the little pink sugar cube at the school I would soon attend. Our moms were grateful when we got the measles, mumps, and chicken pox early, as almost all of us kids of old world heritage handled those diseases much better than any teen or adult. Now actually, I would like to make a little commentary on that point there. Um, first of all, my memory of polio was that my mother actually posted um, a calendar on the wall of the first house we were in up until I was about age four. But it had pictures of children in iron lungs. Uh, she used to uh, go out and canvass the neighborhood in the fall for the March of Dimes. And so I don't know, maybe it had something to do with that. But it was scary. I've heard of polio, I knew it was scary, and I understood later that my mom specifically would not take us to community swimming pools in order to try to prevent polio from coming to us. Only one boy in my elementary school age group actually had polio and came out with a limp after that, but of course I've met many other people who had shortened legs or some other problems with polio, including one of my main mentors, um, co-author uh, with me of a, a paper on Terea Taxifolia Assisted Migration North, and who was a major person in my Ghosts of Evolution book, Paul Martin. Uh, he was really crippled by polio. 
I also wanted to mention the uh, mumps, measles, and chickenpox because I understand those all now have vac vaccinations. But in our day, this is the traditional way you handle it. And that's that obviously people in the old world that could not uh, survive the mumps, the measles, and the chicken pox died off through natural selection. Herd immunity is what we call it now. Uh, sad process, but that's how it worked over generations. And so by the time um, we were adapted here in America from all these different immigrant communities from Europe in particular, um, we had that immunity. And apparently, very much like coronavirus 19, uh, the kids don't have a problem with it. We didn't have a problem with it. I specifically remember the measles in that I was blindfolded. I wasn't supposed to see anything, otherwise it could damage my eyes. I was kept in a dark room. I remember chicken, no, I think it was the mumps. Mumps or chicken pox. My mom was thrilled. My sister went to a uh, brownies, it's like a Girl Scout, uh, campfire girls type uh, meeting at a neighbor's house and word had it that one of the girls there had the mumps or the chicken pox. And so my mom was grateful because then my sister brought it home for me and we had it at the same time. So I know that's a real problem now, this measles thing, you know, when having um, vaccinations, I'm not part of that. But I wanted to stress that here, that there is some similarity with coronavirus 19, and I have that memory, and I could understand how there might be young families with kids um, who aren't worried about COVID-19 for their kids and themselves, um, and they might be struggling to really want to get back to work. So anyway, back to my personal pledge, and I will try not to do as much commentary in the rest. Six decades passed, and I am now among the many who would acknowledge being alive today only because of advanced medical support we received in a hospital. Clearly, I've been blessed. This too is important to say. I have direct experience of elders choosing timely natural deaths. I have thus been mentored in approaching the final stage of life. So now I have a number of paragraphs uh, block quoted here of my personal experience of what I just said. Elders choosing natural timely deaths, which may sound a little bit strange, but it's important to me. So I'll read that now. Such experience does not include my father's death at age 48. He died suddenly 53 years ago while working with a neighbor friend clearing our yards of trees recently killed by Dutch elm disease. I was at church at the time with my sister attending our final confirmation class, Palm Sunday, 1966. My father's parents were living with us at the time. And break away for a moment. Half of the kids I knew in this blue collar working class area just on a, a mile beyond Detroit in the newest suburbs, half of them had a grandparent or two living with them in their homes. It was very common in that day. Five evenings later, I watched my mother gently redirect my 89-year-old grandfather from walking out the door into the cold and dark of early April in Michigan. Instead, he died peacefully in bed that night. So again, that was just less than a week after my father, his son, his only son, had suddenly died. 32 years later, my mother achieved her own timely death by simply allowing old age debilities to carry her off one night, peacefully, at home, after watching her evening primroses open at sunset. She needed nothing more than a few drops of morphine and me alongside, holding her hand. Over the previous five weeks, I had helped her check off, item by item, all but one task on her final to-do list, repair the dining room lampshade. 
my mother would have died much earlier, absent extreme medical interventions and surgeries in her 60s and early 70s. Primarily heart problems, uh, but she also had her gallbladder removed, something else happened with her, and she developed very severely type 2 diabetes. My sister chose to end her own physical and emotional suffering three years ago, right after she got a severe cancer diagnosis. She would have died decades earlier, absent advanced medical interventions. The diagnosis came the day after her 66th birthday. The timing offered a chance to have her final act coincide with the anniversary of our father's death. It would be listed in Seattle statistics as an opioid suicide. I do not regard it as that. So now I arrive in my older years at a time of societal crisis edging dangerously toward the type and scale of crisis, plague and famine, that my maternal great-grandparents and their forebears would have faced episodically in their villages in Hungary and Romania. Okay, I'm going to break away for a second there. And that's that my mother was a first-generation born American in Detroit. She grew up only knowing Hungarian until she went to kindergarten. Uh, and I grilled her and her younger sister, my Aunt Marge, uh, for anything I could learn. And I recorded it on an audio cassette in the late 90s in order to, to learn the family history of both of my grandparents coming over from Hungary and Romania, uh, what prompted them to do that, what they knew about the old country, and it happened to the family. And ultimately, I also ended up getting a list of how many children uh, my great-grandparents in Romania had that included my uh, maternal grandmother. They had had a total of eight children, three of whom died before the first year of their birth and another child died at age 10. So of the eight, only four survived. And one of them was, of course, my grandmother who came to America when she was 19. Uh, my maternal grandfather came, I think he was 15 or 16, uh, coming from Hungary. They both were Hungarian and spoke, uh, spoke Hungarian. And my grandfather in particular, uh, this is something I'm gonna add in. Till the end, till the end, he spoke of himself living here in Michigan as being richer than kings, richer than kings. He felt that all the way through the end. Social Security talked about money for nothing, money for nothing. And he never went to doctors or dentists. He actually pulled his own teeth. Anyway, I'm going to get into more of that to pass on family history at the very end of this. It wasn't appropriate to actually write in a pledge where you immediately have to get it to people in the hospital or something, but it's really significant to understand how unique this age of exuberance in America has been, how unusual we have for keeping elders alive and reducing suffering, it's important to remember that. Back to the reading. I am grateful for the vibrancy of life I have already experienced. I am grateful to know some of the history of family suffering and of how my ancestors responded. Therefore, with calm and gratitude, I make this pledge. Part two, the pledge. I, Connie Barlow, pledge to forego medical interventions outside of my home environment in the event that I become ill for any reason, and especially if I am tested for COVID-19 and show positive. This declaration is made out of love for the younger generations whom I have injured, albeit inadvertently, through my life of fossil fuel-induced 
American style living and traveling. This is one way I can partly and joyfully make amends. Part three and finally, the plea. I, Connie Barlow, plead that my family and friends and medical personnel who may become involved will respect my solemn pledge and thereby do their utmost to ensure that my wish to remain unhospitalized is honored. Non-mechanized forms of comfort support will be welcomed if I appear to be in need while unable to communicate. And my plea to all, grant me in turn this simple gift. Please remember me as one who hereby earned her place as an elder. Signed, Connie Barlow, 17 March, 2020. And my simple blessing, may the forest be with you. Now that's very personal to me. I work with the assisted migration of trees, helping them move north in a time of massive, too fast climate change. But whatever blessing feels good to you, I think it's important this is not just a secular document, but whatever form of religion or sense of the sacred we have, this is a place to express that. It's two days later. Uh, the fish meditation that you just watched, I actually took yesterday and right off the cliff here from the house that we've been generously allowed to stay in uh, the past two months here in Northern California along Freshwater Creek. Over these two days, I've decided that there are two appendixes I wanna add here. One's just a short two minute audio the other one is a 24 minute video, so you might wanna watch that at another time. First, the two minute audio, you're gonna hear exactly the statements I made about my pretty amazing Grandpa Chesley, my maternal grandfather. And you're gonna hear this in the words of mostly my Aunt Marge, uh, my mother's younger sister by two years, and a little bit from my mom as well. That's just two minutes. Uh, the actual voices it means a lot to me. Uh, the video itself, what I found really unusual, I had a vague memory that in 2011, I had already published a video online, it's on YouTube, called Death, Budgets, and I'd forgotten the last word, Generational Justice. Back then I was already into the medical industry spending so much money on advanced care for seniors, even when we don't want it, uh, that I was concerned about it. And I was uh, riffing off a blog that New York Times opinion columnist David Brooks had written in 2011. That was right around the time, I think, that uh, the Affordable Care Act, now called Obamacare, was being debated. And there was some concern uh, by the conservatives that there might be death panels to decide uh, when it was time to pull the plug on granny. And so that was important for me to remember because this is not about pulling the plug on granny at all. In this time of coronavirus 19, it's all about us seniors saying, hey, palliative care, palliative care. And just for this particular time, we can reevaluate things later. So anyway, that is uh, the extracts of, the, of that longer video are 24 minutes long. So starting out here, here's the two minute audio with some 
image overlays I've done, I don't have that many photographs from my ancestry because they weren't digital back in that time at all. And I really wasn't the one who was given the family photos. But I've got a few in there. There are four voices you'll hear in this short little clip. The first is mine. I'm the questioner. And again, this was 1995. The main voice you're going to hear is my mom's younger sister, Aunt Marge, Margaret Show, and a little bit of her husband of many years, Donald Show. They were originally Warszawski. He came from Polish ancestry, and back in the day, you just change your name to whatever you wanted. So Margaret and Don Show, you're going to hear, and only at the very end of the two minutes, are you going to hear my mom's slow voice? She was 72 at the time. And she reiterates exactly what you heard me say earlier on, that my grandpa Chesley felt all the time here in America that he was living richer than kings. Here's the two-minute clip. Now, uh, you, now, your father... Now. Did he ever go to a doctor? I mean, you were saying something about he, he would pull his own teeth? Never went to a doctor, never went to a dentist. He was his own doctor, his own dentist. So did you watch him pull his teeth? No. How did you know this was happening? He'd tell us. He took the pliers and I pulled it out. And everything's okay now. Feels a lot better. So he would take pliers and pull out his teeth? He'd take his pliers that you, you know, use all over the house or outside in the dirt and just pull out his mm -hmm. Do you think he grew up in a place that just had a dirt floor? Oh, yeah. Oh, oh do you yes. think so? Yes. Oh, I think oh, that's yeah. all they had. Joanne Joe told us that the, when she went back, we were already growing. In fact, I was already married. And she went to Europe. Do you remember Joanne Joe going to Europe? And she said things had not changed. They still had the cows that came into the house and slept with them. In the winter time. And yeah. To keep them warm. So there was, right, it was all, um, it had to be dirt floors. Mm -hmm. But that's the way they were brought up. They, you know. And so this would, have, this would have seemed like living just a great life here in America. Yeah. Oh, yeah. My father always did say that America was a wonderful country. He retired and he didn't work and his social security check, that's all he had. Mm -hmm. Social security check came to him and he got paid for nothing, doing nothing. He never looked at it that he had put into it and he was getting that back. Or anything. America was wonderful. It was a wonderful land. He said he was living like a king. Yeah, he felt that way. Now, I want to say here at the start that I think this is Connie's most important material, at least at this time in history. I think that this will be one of her great legacies, is bringing about a way of thinking about death in an intergenerational way and in a profoundly justice-oriented way in terms of how we face death, what we're spending our money on, what our priorities are, and the suffering that comes from handling death and thinking about death and relating to death and the whole process of dying in the way that we currently are. It's not sustainable. And I think Connie has something really important to say on this topic. That's why the emphasis is generational justice. And I'll be reading it with uh, text overlay and photos overlay. Uh, but I'll also be using Michael's voice for the quotations I draw from some other opinion leaders uh, that are male. So let's get started. Death, budgets, and generational justice by Connie Barlow. We think the budget mess is a squabble between partisans in Washington, but in large measure, it's about our inability to face death and our willingness as a nation to spend whatever it takes to push it just slightly over the horizon. 
That's how New York Times columnist David Brooks concluded his courageous July 2011 essay, Death and Budgets. A month earlier, Daniel Callahan and Sherwin B. Newland co-authored a similar call to action published originally in the New Republic and also available online. It's called The Quagmire, How American Medicine is Destroying Itself. These renowned experts on the medical and ethical issues of death and dying contend. In the war against disease, we have unwittingly created a kind of medicine that's barely affordable now and forbiddingly unaffordable in the long run. The Affordable Care Act might ease the burden, but it will not eliminate it. Ours is now a medicine that may doom most of us to an old age that will end badly, with our declining bodies falling apart as they always have, but devilishly and expensively, stretching out the suffering and decay. Can we conceptualize something better? Can we imagine a system that is less ambitious but also more humane? that better handles the inevitable downward spiral of old age and helps us through a somewhat more limited lifespan as workers, citizens, and parents? Callahan and Newland continue. The answer to those questions is yes, but it will require, to use a religious term in a secular way, something like a conversion experience on the part of physicians, researchers, industry, and our nation as a whole. Amen the culture of our medical institutions reinforces it. Death as enemy, sadly, is reinforced as well by the economics of the rating systems for doctors and hospitals. And thus, I regularly challenge my audiences by proposing this. I say, no generations before our own anywhere on earth experienced more prolonged emotional anguish, family discord, and even physical suffering in relation to the passing of elders than do the generations of Americans alive today. David Brooks, Daniel Callahan, and Sherwin Newland have now given me the courage to add this, and none of the multitudes who came before us had an opportunity to die in ways that were as flagrantly heedless of the well-being of future generations as the end-of-life practices that prevail today. Consider, for example, the illness of aging that is the most emotionally and financially devastating of all, dementia. Back on the farm, when Grandpa entered the night wandering phase of what is now called Alzheimer's disease, there would have been no locks on doors. Indeed, when little Johnny noticed Grandpa on his way out one cold autumn evening, Mama would likely have said, Hush, child, it is Grandpa's time to go. Next morning, Grandpa would be found asleep in the barn or the hayfield. No, dead. Death by hypothermia is actually not a harsh way to go. It begins with sleep. The aftermath looks like sleep. If Grandpa survived the wandering phase of Alzheimer's, however, then when he lost the ability to respond to hunger and to feed himself, no one would insist on doing it for him. Or, if a stroke broke his capacity to speak and swallow, no one would rush to install a feeding tube. Rather, hush child, in his own way, Grandpa knows his time is over. And when an elder became bedridden for any reason, heart failure, broken hip, stroke, it would not be long, especially in the winter months, before sluggish lungs would welcome home, quote, the old person's friend, pneumonia. In contrast, several decades ago, my cousin received a call from the late stage Alzheimer's facility where my aunt had been bedridden for several years. Long a victim of bed sores, she had finally contracted pneumonia. When my cousin suggested that no antibiotics be given, he was scolded. You mean you want to kill your mother? Many of us carry stories such as these. Indeed, by the time we reach middle age, almost all of us have at least secondhand awareness of the horrors that arise from the reckless availability of and passive submission to advanced medical interventions that do no more than buy a little time before the next medical intervention is advised. Those increments of weeks and months are purchased at enormous cost. 
For what? And just as importantly, by whom? Probably not by me. I'm 59, and my nation is still piling on the debt and allocating ever more of its tax revenues to paying interest on and rolling over old treasury bills. No, those who will ultimately pay for keeping grandma institutionalized, drugged, and strapped to her chair, or for spending the equivalent of a half dozen college educations in the final six months of grandpa's dwindling life, will probably be the age group whose life prospects are already shrunken and gray, owing to levels of college debt and underemployment that my generation would have considered immoral, if not insane. So yes, I stand with David Brooks. I stand with Daniel Callahan and Sherwin Newland. I stand for generational justice and care and compassion for the dying including those for whom death would be a blessing and would naturally come if we would but stand back and allow it to run its gentle course. So let more of us dare to speak what we already know. Heroic efforts for the disabled elderly are all too often demonic. Whatever communal goods our elders contributed while still hale and hearty, however proud their legacy to offspring, community, and nation, the ways in which they, and more often we, manage their end-of-life care and choices will determine not only how we remember them, but what they effectively pass forward. Will we allow them to pass forward a healthy and prosperous future to the generations in waiting? Or will our sick assumptions about death as enemy consign them passively to the negative side of the ledger? Will we who make the decisions in their stead fail them in our final acts of love. Hush, child, this is Opa's final gift to you and to your children to come. One day, many, many years from now, it will be your time to pass the gift forward. And you will be grateful for that opportunity, just like in his heart, Opa surely now feels. This is a vision that I find beautiful as well as necessary. And I speak from experience, thanks to the simple generosity of an ordinary woman who allowed me to walk to the threshold with her, arm in arm. As I've written about elsewhere, in 1998, my mother fought her way out of the hospital after yet another heart attack. She had received bypass surgery eight years earlier. She explained, Con, I don't want my grandchildren paying for this anymore. As a General Motors widow and Medicare beneficiary, my mother knew that her grandchildren paid not a dime. But Helen considered all the grandchildren in America as her responsibility. And so, yes, her grandchildren would indeed be paying for the next stent or pacemaker or whatever would be installed this time around. She even refused diagnostics. She said, I don't need to know how much I damaged my heart this time, Con. I want to go with a good old-fashioned heart attack, just like my mother did. And so, I was invited to return to live with my mother to help her walk the final path toward her own notion of an honorable death. I felt privileged to comply. As a freelance writer with no children to care for and whose worldview could be trusted to honor my mother's wishes, I would be the helpmeet for this final phase of her life. Five weeks after I moved in and helped her cross off item after item in her final to-do list, she and I together accomplished her threefold wish, to die at home with no pain, well, reduced pain, thanks to morphine, and with someone to hold her hand. Simple, and it was. Yet how few of my peers have a parental end-of-life story as vibrant, even joyous, as mine. This essay is thus a call for generational justice, for generational generosity. It is a call for a religious conversion of sorts. To begin, let us more widely share our stories of elegant and triumphant deaths. And let us share the stories too, where it just seemed to all go wrong, and for far too long. It is time as well to share the sad news stories accumulating of youthful dreams closing down 
like the story of one young woman in Eugene, Oregon. With a master's degree in communication and an abundance of student debt, she was grateful to have the same job she had held as an undergraduate on a call line in a Verizon Center. She told me, all the nonprofit job opportunities are taken, so none of my student loans will be forgiven. My biggest decision now is whether to try to pay them off in 12 years or 20. What about your dreams, I asked. She looked at me incredulously, as if I had spoken in a foreign tongue. Her boyfriend, sitting alongside, glared at me. In that moment, I was just one more overindulged boomer, whose generation was largely responsible for the mess those two had inherited. Earlier in the conversation, I had committed another faux pas. The young woman had told me the story of her beloved grandmother, who encouraged her so much as a child, but who was now saddled with dementia in a nursing home. I said to her, do you realize that just six months of what it cost to take care of your grandmother would probably pay off your entire college debt? The point of this essay is not to restate the case for killing granny, which was the cover story of a September 2009 issue of Newsweek magazine. It is not advocacy for medical rationing or any other top-down directive. Rather, I wish to invite other boomers and what remains the generations ahead of us to co-lead a bottom-up initiative. That initiative would be to just say no to unrealistic, dishonorable, and supremely costly interventions that only prolong suffering, not life. If even a fraction of us do this, then rationing of health care will not be necessary. And so here's my vision. By the time the first boomer generation reaches three score and ten, I'd like to see us coming together as a generation once more and declaring something along the lines of this, that until every 20-something in America and every 30 or 40-something with kids has taxpayer-supported health insurance, and until there are community service options for working off college debt, we boomers will refuse to tap Medicare for any heroic medical interventions beyond our 70s. If we can find a way to ensure that all the youth have a chance to create a full and contributing life, and that they receive no less taxpayer support for their health care than we do, then maybe, or maybe not, we'll accept a Medicare-funded bypass, or pacemaker, or cancer surgery, or hip replacement in our 80s. But until the day that generational justice is assured, we'll foment a new revolution. Not just dignity, but death done with generosity. Death done with celebration and joy and play. Death done in a way that leaves a legacy, not of insupportable debt, but of wondrous stories, of lighthearted farewells and crazy cool send-offs, perhaps like the one I heard about just last week. Michael and I were theme speakers for a week-long church summer camp in the San Bernardino Mountains of California. For nine years, we have lived entirely on the road as America's evolutionary evangelists, bringing the saving good news of a mainstream scientific naturalism to communities from coast to coast. For this particular summer camp, we divided our twin talks into Evolutionize Your Life, that was Michael's topic, and Evolutionize your death and legacy. That was my topic. After each talk outdoors under the pines, the group would reassemble on the lodge porch for a talk back, for which I solicited stories rather than comments and questions, and the group happily obliged. There were stories of trauma, stories of prolonged drama, stories dire enough to ignite a revolution, and there were a few stories as glorious as mine with my mom. One young woman told of how her grandfather, who was dying of cancer at home, called for a final party. Family and friends arrived, told stories, and cried and laughed together. Her bedridden grandfather did too. Then the old man signaled for a prearranged final gift, an extra dose of morphine. He closed his eyes. He died not in secret, not with shame, but with celebration and love and with this story as his final gift. 
So let's proclaim a revolution that clearly has already begun. I suggest a six-fold path that each of us as individuals and small collectives can walk. Consider my suggestions and then offer your own. Step one, seek out a spiritually fulfilling way to embrace death rather than fight or fear it. In my own presentations, audios, and videos, I advocate the epic of evolution, big history, as the science-based worldview that can allure us into befriending death. A variety of sciences have revealed that death not only plays a necessary role, but also a creative role in the emergence of complex atoms, and then life, and complex life and culture in this universe. I also recommend the award-winning documentary, Grief Walker, which movingly explores the death and dying work of Canadian Stephen Jenkinson. The Grief Walker worldview, which was born of ecological, place-based Native wisdom, is compatible with my own and with any other secular or religious perspective that does not make death an enemy. See my husband's poignant post. Thank God for death. Could anything be more sacred, more necessary, more real? Step two, do not wait for middle age or old age to begin your spiritual work of embracing your own inevitable death and the deaths of those you love. There are two powerful reasons to befriend death sooner rather than later. The first reason is for your loved ones. Until you can celebrate death as a natural, necessary and sacred part of the circle of life, you will be like a bull in a china shop when in the presence of those who are consciously and gracefully dying. Worse, you may be the recalcitrant family member whose death denial makes medical staff wary of a lawsuit if they do anything less than everything for your loved one slipping away. The second reason to do the work now is best expressed by Stephen Jenkinson. Not success, not growth, not happiness. The cradle of your love of life is death. So if you want to live fully, then invite the specter of your own death to become your cheerleader for vibrant living. Step three, extend your sense of self as you age to your descendants, to the generations to come, and to the larger body of life. Perhaps the easiest way to shed your own fear of death is to cultivate a sense of what Thomas Berry called your great self. Perhaps begin with redefining yourself within the river of time. Your small self is the whirlpool or the standing wave. Your great self is the river. As well, Joanna Macy, Arnie Nass, John Seed, and other proponents of deep ecology offer profound writings and other resources for cultivating what they call an ecological self. For me, the extended self image I lean toward is that I might feel no more loss at the moment of death than that of a tree losing but one of its leaves. Step four, attend with gusto to your legacy throughout your middle and later years. One's deathbed is not the time to regret how little of merit, of lasting value and consequence you may be passing forward. Instead, discover the joys of giving, of volunteering, of mentoring, of contributing to the younger generations your natural gifts of heart or mind and your acquired skills and wisdom. If you raise children during your life, a perfect time to gently invite legacy consciousness into your choices is when the last one finally leaves home. Step five, seek out opportunities to share your death-friendly perspective and to evoke compassionate listening of the perspectives and stories of others. Explore various ways within your family, church, and community to formally and informally share best practices for overcoming death anxiety and for encouraging an ethic of generational justice and generosity. Best practices include how to firmly but lovingly communicate our own death commitments to family members who may have trouble hearing 
and graciously accepting the choices we intend to make. As well, there's nothing quite as life-giving as expressing heartfelt gratitude to those who have positively impacted you in some way, or sorrow and regret, and a sincere apology to those you've consciously or unconsciously harmed. Finally, step six. Take a deep dive into reconsidering the dance between individual rights and broader responsibilities in the death and dying process and in advanced care for the elderly. Right to die ideally would be accompanied by an ethic of responsible communication, a commitment to lovingly but firmly communicate one's intent with all loved ones for whom withdrawal from medical intervention or active life termination may conflict with religious or other norms, or for whom death anxiety is so strong that conversation about death has been difficult in the past. As well, those who actively choose generational generosity rather than costly medical interventions have a unique and powerful opportunity to heal estranged familial relationships and tarnished friendships. Not only does impending death signal a last chance for reconciliation, but it is not unusual for those who calmly and clearly renounce medicalized dying to access remarkable psychological resources of patience, power, and empathy. It is then that miracles can occur. Old relational wounds truly can be healed. Just as important, clearly communicated and legally enforceable intents and actions are essential for preventing new rifts among family members that may ensue if irresponsibility on the part of the dying pushes the decision-making downstream. Oh, Helen, you'll have to come again soon. Oh, no, dear. This is the last time. It's been lovely. <laughs>